I'm going to text Janice real quick and make sure she got my text. So get on you if you don't. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I love Janice. I don't want to. <laughs> so today I wanted to show you all, and we can we have questions to go over as well. So we'll do that after it kind of show you uh, my stringing kit and brand new cleaning kit. And um, I don't mean for this to be a big plug for Supply 88, but basically everything I'm talking about is a Supply 88 item. We're not, we're not sponsored by them. They're just good friends of ours and they build good stuff. And then the end of it, I'll also show you the prototype tool that is the first ever artisan tool being created. And we're super excited about that. And so we'll get your feedback on that. But first things first, you all have probably seen this, but I've seen a lot of stringing toolkits lately. And as great as they are, I think Andy had a great one. It's just a lot larger than the one I carried. And so it'd be nice to, for everybody to know the differences. So, you know, Andy had that big string kit, and that's typically what I've had in the past. But today, I only have this. This is my entire stringing kit. What is this, about five inches wide and, I don't know, 14 inches long? And so it's very compact. It comes in a case. And so Almost this looks is, like a large toiletry bag. It, that yeah, and, that's what air, it's a large, and it's light. It's really light. I mean, in comparison to have all the, 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 the wire in one spot, usually that's pretty heavy. And a lot of that is the metal tins or the metal casing. But because nothing here is metal, it's a lot lighter. So these are available at Supply 88. And you can buy them pre, um, they call them pre-wired. Um, and these are called wire tires is what they call them. And so basically the entire kit fits in like this. And I believe if I'm right, to get the entire kit with all of the wire and all of the wheels is like $200. It's like ridiculously cheap. I even told, I even told Mark, I'm like, dude, I pay like twice that for this. This is epic. And so all of these, as you can see, are numbered. You have your sizes, different sizes, so you can keep them all in order. And the brilliance of these tire tires are several things. One is they're super light. That's the big one. They're all numbered, as you can see. Can you see that? We're going to see it there. They're kind of, yeah, right there. I like think it, it showed better when you had it on the spool where you saw the writing. I think you got to have some light coming at you. Yeah, there you can see. So oh. they're all numbered yeah, in, in, yeah. in half sizes. So 12, 12 and a half, 13, 13 and a half, so on and so forth. They're very light stamped. But the big thing is if you notice, there, it's not entirely round right here. It's got these little cutouts. Can anybody guess why those cutouts are there? To help better grab the string out of the close yeah. and that's a secondary feature it, it, it stops the string when the string's coming out of the spool it's a lock mechanism for the string 100 percent, and that's the number one thing that's always been a trouble with those metal uh tins is one it can get sucked in there and then you'll never find it you have to like put your finger in there try to find it or it just kind of unspools and so yes right here see i just it literally just happened and it stopped itself right there. Beautiful design. Mark Perney, you brilliant, beautiful designer. I love you. And so this is this is just an exceptional design. It comes with plenty, plenty of wire to do all your service calls to fix strings here and there. Um, and, and, and it's just a phenomenal, phenomenal tool. And I thought that that was like, okay, this is as good as it gets. And then like one of our technicians, um, when we got it, was like, hey, did you know that the center opens up? I'm like, what? He opened it up. And sure enough, all, and I don't have all of them in here, all of your stringing tools, your micrometer, your needle nose, your pin pounder, your coil lifter, all fit right within there. And it is the most simple, beautiful design item that I've pretty much ever seen in the piano servicing world. It's just absolutely everything that you need. Um, I believe if you contact Mark and just say, hey, I'm with P, I'm, no, <laughs> I'm with the artisan thing. 
<laughs> They'll probably give you a discount. <laughs> I have sizes going from 12 and a half down to 22 in this. So 22 or 12 and a half all the way through 22. That's about that, that. That really does the whole range. You don't need anything else. I think it's missing a couple sizes because Mark suggested. Uh, no, I'm just going to look at it. It's got 12 and a half, 13, 13 and a half, 14, 14 and a half, 15, 15 and a half, 16, 16 and a half, 17, 17, 18, 18, 18. Yeah, it has everything. Yeah, on the website, it says it goes from 12 all the way up to 22. Yeah, so it has everything right there. And um, yeah, I get, I think they're a couple hundred dollars when they're fully round, wound with everything. And the fact that it comes with the nifty little case. I'm a sucker, as you're going to see with my cleaning kit. I'm a sucker for a good zip bag. Something that keeps everything contained. And this just does it so beautifully. The things I would recommend keeping inside the center uh, uh, of this would be obviously needle nose pliers, would be your caliper, your micrometer, probably those little pinchy uh, clamps so you could clip the string onto the hitch pins. It will be a, 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 a coil lifter, um, probably a stringing, uh, excuse me, a, a tuning pin uh, coiler, and maybe a couple other random things, but everything really does fit nicely in there. Questions about this tuning, or excuse me, uh, string kit versus maybe other things that you've seen? Robert, this is one that I would definitely recommend for you as you're getting out there more and more. And this eventually there will be more strings breaking as you just get exposed to more. And to be able to have something is <laughs> definitely not a bad idea. Oh, another thing that I'll keep in this kit as well in that center console are bits, a uh, length of, of a larger gauge string. So that if I'm doing a string tie, I'm doing a string tie of a, a bass string. So that also will be larger string sizes, you know, 20 to 22. And so just to have a length of those, you know, in there will be good to have. I have a question on bass strings for the wound mm -hmm. strings, just because I'm ignorant. Are they customized, you know, essentially for the piano, the gauge, et cetera, for whether you're like, you know, A0, you can't just go buy one for that particular note? Correct. You can buy what they call universal bass strings, and those will be very short in comparison. They're, they're basically just shorter strings for pianos, like shorter bass strings. We don't really recommend those because they never quite sound right. So what you have to do is remove the bass string. And yes, the winding itself is a certain length. The actual winding is a certain length. The diameter of it, the core diameter. Uh, yes, Stacy, thank you. Those are the four measurements. Core, the winding, the hitch pin to winding, and then the overall winding is what you have to look for. Yeah, the, the one thing at the PTG event where I did the 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 base string measurements, they were actually doing from the tuning pin to the A graph and where the length from the, the start of the winding and then on the backside to the bridge, if I remember correctly, I'd have to go look at my notes, but it's similar to what you're talking about here, but they yeah. were, they actually had you practice going to each one of the tension points, the tuning pin to A graph, the where did the 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 winding start? Where did the winding end? Where did it hit the bridge? Yeah, where did it, you know into hitch pin? So they had all of those. Yeah, I think in one of the next uh, 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 lives we do, it'll be good. It'll just be base string duplication. Here's the two ways you can do it. You can either send in a template or you can do these measurements and here's the measurements to do it. And we'll actually measure the broken string and be like, okay, here's the exact measurements for this and here, here's how you get it. Here's who you send it to. Yeah, and I think most of the sites from what I heard at the workshop, they actually tell you what to measure. If you're going to a certain site, they'll tell you what they're um, what they what they want. So you just follow their instructions and get a good measurement. Stacy, we do a lot of MAPE string duplication. We send them to MAPES. Um, can you give us an idea of roughly how much it costs 
to get a string um, from them, a bass string, a single. Just so you all know, you know, kind of the up. rough idea. Let me, okay, I'm going to check because it's gone it, It's gone up a little this year. So mm -hmm. I'm going to double check, you know, every, but. It really has. Back in the day, I remember them being like $25. We were calculating last month, David. It was, you know, I want to check. I don't want to say. The, the, the copper for the copper windings probably went up. It must have, but yeah. I believe they're um, $50 I, a base. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm, I'm going to check, but. Actually, I have a receipt on my phone, so I'll find that and put it in the chat while we're talking. Cool. But yeah, yeah they, they're so good, though. I love Mapes. They they yeah. can come really they come really quick. I can usually once I order the bass string, I already schedule the appointment for two weeks out to install it. That way, I don't have to remember. And they're really yep. good about it. <laughs> I've never had it not come on time. They're We've really also cool. stopped sending them bass strings and instead mm -hmm. take all the measurements at the shop, keep the string at the shop, and then email it to them. And that makes the whole thing that much faster. Plus, we can keep the original in case there's an issue. It just seems odd that they ask for the measurements nowadays when everything else just comes in a gauge. Now, do they come in a single hitch pin? Do they, did the loop already made when you get the bass string? Do we have to make that too? Yep, all that's made. So okay. basically you're that's, able to- That's why you're doing the measurements because you need to know where the windings start and stop so that you yep. don't have it sitting on the bridge and stuff. Exactly. And it'll come ready, Robert, to simply, you put that on, you put it up to the tuning pin and you're gonna cut the excess off of there. You're gonna definitely wanna twist that bass string one turn with the direction of the winding that way it just kind of compresses itself that's one thing i didn't know initially um but that's a good thing to kind of keep in mind is give it that half turn or quarter turn yeah i'm looking at my pictures of the receipts and like i have it covered the price on like all these i'll try to find it i think it's 40 40 something and then shipping yeah so when you're going to customers' houses and you, uh, you know, a not you break a bass string when a bass string breaks, yeah. <laughs> let's get that under. When a bass string breaks, just know that yeah, it's gonna be at least fifty dollars just for the part, not including you coming out back out and installing it. Wow, Isn't that crazy. What direction are they? Is the copper normally wound clockwise, counterclockwise? Is there a traditional winding direction or does that matter? I feel like I've seen both, but it may be that I was just looking at one end of the string and not the other. <laughs> but you'll be able to see the direction when you're kind of looking at it like, okay, it's okay. winding counter. I'm going to wind it in that direction. Okay. Don't wind it in the opposite because then it just loosens up everything. So, so, David, as far as going back out, you're just charging them, you know, say like you're going to be there for an hour, you just charge them an hour's service call type of thing? or Exactly. We charge a minimum service call fee to do that. So for us, it's $195 plus the, part of the, plus the string. Yeah. So you're looking $250. But we'll also in that service call, let's just say four strings broke. Then they're not paying, they're going to be able yeah. to get all four of those strings installed at that same one service call. And at that same time, if we have time, we'll also touch up the, the tuning as well. We'll probably mute off that new bass string just because it's going to stretch so much. We will try to pre stretch it by pressing into it with special tools and just trying to break in that string as much as possible and we'll leave it sharp. And then we'll hope. Then hopefully the customer will have us back in about six months. In which case we can touch it up then. Yeah, and I'll even look at the schedule. And if we're like five minutes away from their house in the next like six weeks, we can just swing by for like five minutes. It doesn't take yeah. long. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question, Dave. So you, yeah. you kind of just answered it. But normally, do you you'll just wait the six months or a year till you go back to pull it back up? Or do you always try to go back a few weeks later? I used to. And then fast forward and we have like half a dozen technicians doing strings. And it's like, wow, all these free slots are eating into our bottom line. And so we just had to eventually be like, yeah. you know what? We can, you know, come back if we're in the area or just wait six months, we'll mute it. Because it was just eating us alive. Mm, I see. And, and so to mute it, do you just put a piece of felt? What, what do you use? Just a felt mute or? Yeah, usually a piece of felt mute or 
just a piece of the felt or even a piece of the rubber mute. Okay, awesome. Yeah, we and as long as you let the customer know, like you like make it very clear, this is going to go out of tune. Like if you don't tell them that, they they, they call me and they're like, sounds terrible. I'm like it's a new stream. <laughs> they need to know, they need to know. It's gonna take a while, but yeah, that's literally yeah. the best way. And then um, I use, we use Gazelle, right? So I'll look and see, are there any appointments within five minutes in the next, if there is, I just schedule that. So. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, and again, you won't charge for that five minutes. It's just, just going real quick and pulling it if, up. Yeah. If it's just like a, if it really is just like five minutes away and it's a touch up string, I wouldn't charge. I can still fit every, enough appointments in that day. And yeah. Yeah, but it has to work out that way. <laughs> I'm not gonna yeah, drive yeah. twenty minutes to no. <laughs> okay, awesome. That's a good question. Yeah, it's hard because as business owners, we have to look at everything. And as in the beginning, it's a little easier to do. Like ah, I have enough time. I'm just gonna build this in and whatever else. But as you grow, as you get more busy, because as you as all of you grow your businesses, you're gonna get to the point where you're a week booked, three weeks booked, two months booked. Yeah, and then you just as much as you want to help people, you just don't have the time. So, yeah, believe it or not, I've worked with techs that are booked a year out. I mean, a year out. Yeah. Time for another the, help. Time for help. I had the PDG chapter meeting last night and was talking to one of the techs, and he's booked out through the, you know, a hundred percent through the end of June already. But he's also a concert tech, so he actually has you know, a lot yeah. of concert work pre booked. So. That's awesome. Yeah, you all get there. You all get there. It's, you know, I can see it in all of you that you want to do good work, that you're, you're, you're coming to these every week because it matters to you to learn as much as you can to offer that to your customers. So eventually it will happen. Oh. My cleaning kit is oh, brand David, new real quick, me. just oh, yeah, go ahead. the list of the the tools that you had with your wire mm -hmm. kit you had a string lifter a coiler your your crank for the you know mm -hmm. making the coils and what else did you have in there micrometer uh -huh. needle nose pliers round nose pliers i usually have also a uh, a pin like a uh uh if I have to tap a tuning pin, one of those pins, because right. I'll have my mallet in my auxiliary kit if I need to. And then also one of those little mini clamps that we can clamp on the hitch pin to make it so that that string stays in place. That's pretty much it. You know me, I'm always trying to pare down, pare down, pare down. So, oh, you could also have, um, a down bearing gauge if you're curious like oh hey is there any down bearing on this bridge and eventually i'll show you how to use one of those they're kind of they're kind of cool let me explain that because i just kind of threw something out there that maybe a lot of you might not know um the string sorry <laughs> i'm gonna show you here We're going to pretend, we're going to do a little pretending. We need our imaginations. Okay, so we got this hanger. This is the string, okay? And right here is the bridge. What you don't want is that bridge to be underneath that string uh, and, and below it quite a bit. You actually want that string to be compressed over that, that bridge. There has to be what we call deflection. And so that is the string has to sit on that bridge and have downward pressure on that bridge. And when we don't have any deflection, that means that that bridge is too low and that string is basically floating on that bridge. It's not pressing down on it. And so with that, usually you won't have the strings ring out. You might have buzzing sounds and that's a good thing to know going into it. So having this little gauge that rocks back and forth to tell if there is deflection. Kind of that in a nutshell. <laughs> and if ever I kind of throw a term out there that you're like, what is that? Just like point up your hand or kind of have this face like, and I'll, I'll try to come back to it.
Any questions, more questions about the stringy stuff before I move on to the cleaning? I'm super excited about this cleaning kit. This is literally like the second time I've opened it. So I got them back. I got it from um, Supply 88. And as you know, I probably bought it because it came in a little bag. So this is it. I usually will have some kind of a bag of rags or a box of rags in my car because they get gross. And same with trash bags. I don't want to put a bunch of gross used rags in this thing and everything like that. So this will just carry kind of the essentials of what I would want. I haven't put my spray bottles, my mini spray bottles in this yet. So in the spray bottles will be just a little bit of 409 in one spray bottle, maybe some Keybrite, some uh, gloss piano uh, cleaner, and then also a little bit of soap and water. That's kind of all you need. Victor, you did a lot of cleaning. Is that kind of what you got up to? Yeah, that's that's a, pretty much exactly the same thing. 409, yeah. key bright, uh, uh, some sort of gloss cleaner, and uh, yep. soap yeah. and water. Yep, that's pretty much it. And you can buy little bottles of it, and that's what works just fine, and it'll fit in this. But this is, let's see if I remember how to open it. So this is very simple but it actually really has everything I need. I really love this. This is one of those uh, Slim Jims, but it's completely felted. So there's no possibility of David scratching the soundboard with this guy. And it not only, you know, not only can you push, you can push a rag around with this, but it itself is a rag that you're able to kind of droop down there and move and get all the dust out go back and forth so this is basically a felted slim gym and i don't know i'm i'm all about it i'm digging this tool you've all seen these and these are great i think the only thing really cool about this one is that it has a blue cover instead of a red which i'm all about and it's got this cool wooden handle, which you know I'm all about. <laughs> but this is a great, great tool. I would probably add one more miniature one of these in the kit. So I'll probably buy one of those. <laughs> That's the only thing that I think is the downside of this kit is that they could have used another one of these in a smaller version. Mark, if you're listening, I love you, brother. But get another one of these and we'll totally be all about it. So it's got this. And this allows you to not only push, again, the rag around, but it allows you to use this and um, gather up the dust. Victor, what do you use to clean it? I just kind of use soapy water and then I just kind of yeah. wipe it down. Uh, I won't, I won't put any solution on it just so that I don't ruin the felt. So I will use uh, shop towels and okay. I'm going to use a solution. I'll put the solution on the shop towel and then use that to press and it keeps them pretty dry. Okay. Uh, yeah, if there's a light layer of dust, then I'll use the felt to get it out. And then I'll just vacuum the, the felt very gently yeah. on the, the end of that tool. Yeah, yeah. And That's then it, really... Just so everybody knows, if the the shaft cleaning set like that, I think it's the, um, I, can't, uh, the I can't remember the company, but it's on shaft. It comes with three sizes. So the really mm -hmm. long one, a medium, and then a really short, uh, and it's smaller to get into the very high treble. If I remember, it's around one hundred and fifty dollars for that. Am I wrong? Uh, let's see. I think no, I think it's seventy dollars for the three. Okay, seventy dollars. So that's what this costs as well. So that's good to know. Um, did it come with a bag? No, no bag. That's the thing. Yeah. Okay. You know, not me. <laughs> I know what handle. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then the last thing that it has is this, and I actually am a big fan of this. This is fantastic. This is. A nice soundboard cleaner. It is it is fairly rigid, but it's flexible. And so I can really flex it just to where I want and really get underneath the strings nicely. So this kit comes with the bag and then these three core tools. Um, the thing I like about it is it keeps it really compact in more of this vertical sleeve that I can then fill up with a couple bottles. So at the end of the day, it's only taking up this much space in the back of my car. And I'm, I'm kind of digging that. I am gonna go ahead and add those solution bottles to this. And I do know that it should fill up nicely and not be too intense, but I'm gonna play around with this. I got it from the Arizona, 
uh, for we're starting an Arizona branch. And so I wanted to get a bunch of tools down here. So I'll probably be using it with some of the Arizona customers and seeing what happens. See if we can get some snakes and scorpions out of pianos with it. The, uh, that sweeper tool you were talking about mm -hmm. a few weeks back, <clears throat> it is on shaft and it's uh, 75, How much? I think. 75. Oh my goodness, the big one. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Stacy, can you put that on the <laughs> order list? That's awesome because $100 was too much for it. But it was also like just at that borderline. So $70, $75, that's a home run. It won't fit in this guy, but you can at least have it in the background. I don't think you could bend it. I think it'd snap. Before we go over the artisan tool, let's go through some questions. I think there's some questions that people submitted. And maybe if people have questions as well. I'm excited about questions. We have good ones today. This is a good one. Another cleaning question on cleaning with liquids. Just, mm -hmm. just some clarification on where to use liquids or damp cloths, when to use 409 water, when to not Great use anything question. with moisture. I mean, that's a really good question. Yeah. That is a fantastic question. And for that question, I'm going to turn it over to our resident piano cleaning expert, Victor. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, so if we're talking 409, I'll use that on anything that's kind of stuck on there. So plates, but David did say, be careful on plates. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I've, I've never run into any issues, but I'm guessing maybe older paints, uh, they might not be, uh, able to handle that, but 409 on plates, things like that, plastics. Uh, if you're going to clean the case, uh, polish, like a, a gloss case, I would use something that has a lot of, um, lubricity so something like a uh, uh, we use a car detailer or like a waterless wash so it's very very uh, it has a lot of lubrication in it so it's not going to scratch the paint uh, yeah mm. th that gloss finish uh, we also use wood cleaner for um, for maybe like a walnut case or something like that and if it's satin black just water uh, just water that's fine but, and we use a lot of brushes. So you spray 409 in it and you can hit places that you might not be able to get with the towel or something like that. We use a lot of shop towels. You hit towels. that with the, like the pin block area where it's hard yes. to get in between there? Yeah. Yes, the pin block area, just be you know very conservative with the amount you're putting in the brush and we vacuum it out very quickly so none of it seeps down uh, into the block itself. Um, well, if, you, if you don't wanna do that, just get uh, shop towels and try your best to get in there. Q-tips you know, soak a Q-tip and some 409, get in between the tuning pins if you want to get really, really into it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then shop towels, that's what we we'll use to get under the strings. Uh, we also use dust cloths, like the Swiffer cloths, to mm -hmm. get the bulk of the dust. If it's really, really dusty, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not fun to have a wet rag with dust on it. So we'll get the bulk of the dust with those Swiffer rags. That's uh, a great idea. I've never done that. Yeah, and uh, they're disposable, so we'll get the bulk out and then go back with our cleaner, and it's so, so much easier after that. Um, the keys, if they're really, really bad, 409, but Keybrite usually gets everything off. Yep. Um, I know a lot of people like to put tape on keys, so if you run into that, uh, just a little bit of goo gone. Uh, I would only, on, on the plastics, I wouldn't try that on ivory, but on plastics... Yep. Yeah, just some goo gone. It'll get the adhesive off, adhesive off, and then go back with your key bright or 409. But that's how we do it. We try to use shop towels, throw away what we can, but uh, only microfiber on the cases itself. Never, Perfect. never paper towels, never shop towels. Microfiber, yep. whether it's satin or gloss or whatever it is. But yeah. What about the soundboards, Victor? What are you all using for the soundboard cleaning? For the soundboard, we'll get shop towels and a very light mist of 409 and clean that uh but nothing with alcohol in it nothing that will dry out the wood i know a lot of people yeah. like to use baby wipes um i just i don't know i don't like <laughs> i don't want to be carrying baby wipes around <laughs> but yeah uh, just, yeah very conservative with the 409 on a on a rag uh easiest thing is pull the action out and and the treble section you can get your rag in there with yep, your hand grand. yeah and then with that the tool that david was showing with the the sleeve on it the slim jim or if you have a soundboard steel, just being very careful, push it around. And if you have those tools that you can press down, you know, work, work your way 
uh, I like to work my way from the treble to the bass just because. Oh, you know, it, yeah. Yeah, just because you're putting that chop towel in through there. And so we work our way that way. Uh, if you have that microfiber uh, duster thing, we have one of those and we'll put it underneath the bass section. It'll get rid of a lot of that dust in that, in that section there. <laughs> What's your series of, and this is interesting because I actually start from the bass and go to the treble, so everybody's mm -hmm. different. But what would your uh, series of things be? Will it be like plate, soundboard, pin block, case, case? Yeah. So what would it be? What would be the, yeah. for you okay. guys? So first thing, pull the action. We'll clean the cavity in there and get everything out. Mm -hmm. And then I'll move on to the pin block uh, or okay. the, the pins, the tuning pins, clean that. Uh, we also use Scotch-Brite, uh, go over the tuning pins if there's rust on them. They'll shine up the, pin, the, the pins real nice. And then uh, do the, the plate area around the pin block. And then we'll move on to if we're going to remove rust from strings, do that next uh, because anything that's going to fall down you want to clean it you don't want to do that last and you know after yeah. you just clean the whole thing so clean the strings if you're going to do that and then i'll start working my way under the strings cleaning everything from under the strings then i'll clean the plate the remainder of the plate um and then i'll do the case and mm -hmm. then uh, we're going to do action work we'll work on the action and then we'll usually clean the keys last and then if, you know, just from touching the fall board and stuff, we'll hit it one more time, just the front area yeah. with uh, the case, you know, things like that. <laughs> just so that everybody knows, one of the things that we didn't start doing it until Alan introduced us with these smaller air compressors, because we'd always done it manually. We had a little vacuum to clean it up, but when you can get compressed air and the customer's cool with you doing that, that is such a game changer using the tools, but having that compressed air to get it out fast. Um, you do have to ask the customer if they're okay with it. Just tell them like, hey, we're gonna try to clean it, keep it as much as in the piano area. But that was a game changer for when I did it. I was like, wow, this does make a big difference. So Victor, is there any, uh, you mentioned the, the plate and 409 close to the strings. I mean, is there any place that you just do not want to get moisture on besides the strings? Uh... Just try and just, I wouldn't spray the 409 directly on anything. Uh, Put it on the rag? Yeah, yeah, I would just, I wouldn't spray it on like, you know, don't mist it over the soundboard or the, the pin block. So just, I kind of turn away from the piano, spray it on the rag, come back and then do that. Same thing, I turn around, spray it into the brush, come back to the piano and work on it. Um, I just, I, I never spray anything directly onto the piano. Same thing with the keys. I never spray the key bright directly on the keys. Yep. Turn around, spray it on the rags, do, do it like that. Um, the only time I'll ever spray directly on something is, uh, we call it the ashtray, like on, uh, on the yep. most grand. Yeah, so do we. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's in the plate, uh, that little yeah. compartment right yeah. there. Yeah, that little compartment right there in between the bass and the, the tenor section. Uh, sometimes it gets like kind of gunked up there with stuff. So I will, if it's really bad, I'll just spray a little 409 in there, let it sit for 30 seconds or so, and then go back. That's the only time I'll ever spray directly on the on the piano. But yeah. And, and Robert, in answer to your question, you don't want to get a lot of moisture in the pin block tuning pin area. That's where you don't want to get that moisture. And what Victor did is a good su suggestion. He actually um, put some on the brush itself that he's going to be kind of doing and then using a high quality, high intense vacuum to suck it up before it wicks down in there. It's a great idea. Okay. That felt that gets all gunked up right on the bridge, like on a grand, especially, mm -hmm. you know, right before they spill their syrup on the hammers. Yeah. But how do, what do you work to get that out? Uh, I, you want me yeah. to that, David? Yeah, yeah, I know what we use. I'm curious to use. <laughs> yeah, we just use uh, the Scotch Brite since we're gonna clean those strings right there anyway. It's usually strong enough that it'll kind of take that top layer of felt off and it'll get rid of any kind of staining. Um, every once in a while, if something is really thick, like the syrup, like we're not able to get all of it out because it, it's gone through the felt. Uh, but it'll get rid of like a dark spot pretty good. Or if it's just mm -hmm. something that's just on the surface, the Scotch Brite will usually take that scrape that top layer off and then we vacuum it and then it makes the felt look real nice does yeah. anybody use yeah. a brush on the tuning pins any type of i guess a metal brush especially if there's rust to break that off i've used um 
a, a, a drill attachment actually the, those there's like a drill attachment with a long bristle it's like wire brush mm -hmm. and and gone through and that shines them up nice and clean you just have to be careful that you don't scratch the plate up obviously um but that's a good way if there's significant rust to really clean those up okay another question has mm -hmm. anyone ever used like magic spill to try to get like syrupy stuff out um that's the kind of uh, it's not exactly kitty kitty litter, but same concept. Because um, um, I used to work at a grocery store a few years back, and we removed a uh, a soda machine, and there was this syrup all over the floor. And I was like, "How are we going to do this?" And someone like just use magic spill. And for some reason, magic spill like over time just kept taking off the layer of the gunk, and huh. um, and, and uh, that was a really quick solution. And I didn't know if if that's ever been tried on anything. I've never done that. I'd be interested to try that actually on plates that mm -hmm. for a century have had this stuff going on in discoloration. That'd be worth a try. Okay. No, I've never done it. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay. Ready for another? I have a yeah. show and tell. Um, everyone, everyone who works on a piano eventually comes across one of these so one of our awesome techs came Aww. across one when they were <laughs> that was you robert right oh girl my first one your first it gets oh. crazier because Hello. when you show the show the next picture stacy this is what i think i'm losing my mind but i think this it's one? true every bridal the same same piano they chewed all it the up. bridal straps are Oh, yeah. off. I'm oh, yeah, pretty that's sure that, that sucker not every one of those off on both <laughs> ends because there's a little nest of bridal strap pieces and then he got so tired he died. <laughs> I, I mean, I thought David amazing. left the chat. I, I I'm this happened, close. But that was crazy. I mean, I pulled the action out of this spinner because I really just wanted to oil the flanges on the hammers. And then I realized, where'd all the bridal straps go? And that's when I started thinking, did that mouse do it? Because they don't look cut, do they? Has that happened? No. I mean, is this common? This is common. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you I, see I, that, Robert? You, 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 you glove up fast. Glove up. You don't want to get the bubonic plague or anything. Jeez. Well, you don't want to get hantavirus. <laughs> Do you remember back from my Thompson on how dirty it was? I'm surprised I didn't have a rat's nest in that one. Wow. Yeah. Well, I just thought of a few good memes for that dead rat or dead mouse. That would make a meme somewhere. But my question with these bridal straps, I mean, I just want to get this. I feel like Bruce on Monday. I just wanted to run away from this spinet uh, because Replacing these these bridal straps, can you just put the clip on ones instead of trying to use the glue kind? Yes, you, ab you absolutely can. And this is a spinet. So um, and it looks like the design of these uh, bridal wires, they don't have the loop. It just kind of puts over the top of it. Is that right, Robert? Yes. That's nice. But yeah, I would just simply do the, um, does it, it doesn't have a hole for the cork. It looks no, like it's well, it does have a well. Yes, I'm I looking think it right does. there, Stacy, at the butt area and the catcher. It looks like it should have a hole right there at the at the catch. And um, if you go up a little bit, Stacy, to the right. Yeah, I go to the right. Yeah, right there. There should be a hole. I'm curious if it does. And in which case, I always will opt for the um, cork over the uh, clip, if possible. Oh, you have it in your house, Robert? Yeah, it's right here. Oh, no. Okay, so yeah, you do have the cork. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, well, so then, Robert, I, I would go ahead and put the cork style in there. Okay, perfect. Because I thought I'm not small. Do you think that could have affected these hammers that were just slow in return? No, a lot of people think the bridal straps are to help the, the action reset. It's not. It's actually exactly for what you've done right here, 
which is when you remove the action, it keeps those whippings from falling down. Okay, that's kind of what I figured, but I did get a good swing on my nice. So, but anyhow, I couldn't get down there in this uh in the spin it because being dropped, but anyhow, it was just a nightmare for these people? with the mouse. And and I thought those bridal straps, I just thought, oh my gosh. But that's good news that I can at least uh do the cork. Do the cork. Save yourself some time. Are you doing this for free for them? I mean, this is very generous of you. <laughs> I know. Well, I got to have some spin at practice. You do? And I figured this is now or never. She wants to just give it to her nephew. So I don't even have to tune it. I just need to get the action back in, get the bridal straps on. You have Put a place some... in heaven, my friend. You are man. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely after this one. <laughs> Oh, I, you guys, I, we had a customer once, um, and we would do a full trade-in value and the first trade-in the first time he traded the piano and it was my, it was mice. I was like, Oh, it's not, a, I mean, I didn't even keep the piano. It was so, it was a spin it just like that. Just mice damage this. Then like three years later, he wanted to trade up his piano a little bit better. He got a little entry kind of like mine back here. And then he got like a U1, a used U1. That one came in with mice too. And I was like, Oh, oh. And, and mm. he did it twice. And I was like, I, I can't keep like, but we, anyway, it was a yeah, What do you say to him? Like, hey, you got a rodent I'm problem. Like, at and your he house. would just do one like slightly better, you know? Like, <laughs> so I was like, basically, you let the mice eat the piano and then you treat it. And it was bad. Anyway. Uh, oh, well, so. it's a Baldwin Acrosonic. And I think Stacy mentioned that that's probably one of the better spinet models. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the action's a little better. <laughs> I mean, I mean said, the action's I working is not better than mice, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> I said that to Bruce the other day because this his, his spin it issues. <laughs> okay. So sad. Oh, okay. Here's another one. Yamaha upright middle pedal. It'll mm -hmm. yeah, it'll never be used. Is it even? Wait, elementary classroom. Yeah, what's missing? I, I don't know. I think it's it's it. Go ahead. Where they're just gone. I, yeah, and the, for some reason, a lot of schools, the mute rails are just missing. You know what? Uh, it's a they Yamaha made a dummy dummy pedal for a while on a lot of. I'm not even joking. They they're literally just are there cosmetically. Is this one of those cases? Do you think, David? No, it's not in this case. Or is it just missing? <laughs> it's, yeah. So if you if you go up to the top, if you look at if you look at the picture on the right, so everything is there on the picture on the left. That's great. I see yeah. all the parts there. The picture on the right, you have the rod coming up and then it does this U shape. Um, and so, and then at the very, if you go up a little bit, maybe six inches, you see there's that other thing poking out right there. That's gonna be where yeah. spring, spring goes down. And so what this is missing, and you should be able to order that this on Yamaha, you may be able to, is the rail itself, the, the muffler rail. And then it has these brackets on either side of that. And then a spring that holds onto that bracket and then a little hitch on the bottom of that bracket for that, that uh, rod to come through. So that's what you need. Whether we can, you can find it, I'm not sure. But this is actually intended to be used and it was there at one point. Is this a P2? Okay. This is, it's a Baldwin. I'm gonna oh, it's a Baldwin. Down the hall. Down oh, the hall. okay. Got it. Well, that's good. It's good to know. Yeah, I, have a, I have a quick question. Uh, can you install those uh, on pianos that don't have that system, like the middle pedals being used to uh, hold up just the bass dampers? Um, you, they make an aftermarket system. I think Shaft sells it. And what it is, it's a system that has the felt and that they have these brackets that stick onto tuning pins. So what you do is you actually stick, and it looks like this, like a uh, uh, scissor lift, like a reverse scissor lift, scissor lift. So it like lowers this felt down. And the way you do it is actually there's a cable, like a bike cable, and you thread that down underneath where like underneath the key bed, and it has a lever. 
and you just kind of push it in and out. I believe the cost of that is a couple hundred dollars to buy the mechanism, but it allows any upright to be have that feature. Um, and so we usually used to charge like $500 installed for this thing. And yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah, I've yeah. seen and those installed it, before. Does it yep. work pretty good? Like, I mean, do you ever run into issues with them? It looks super janky, but it works really pretty well. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, because my brother yeah. just got a Kawhi console, but and we, we like those rails because you know yeah. we play a lot in in the house, and so he was asking me if if I can if there's aftermarket, so I'll, I'll yep, look into that. That is the one. I have seen that myself installed on a, quite a few pianos, and yeah, it works. So. Yeah, actually, we might want to. I think I actually might want to order one of those, Stacy. Put that on the list, and maybe we can install one because the one at the shop doesn't have a practice rail. Ah, uh, cool. Yeah. That, that uh, might be fun to install. Yeah. Talking about <laughs> uh, mute rails, uh, the worst rat infested piano I've seen. The rat oh, ate the entire mute rail, like all the felt was just gone. And uh, it had made the biggest pile I've ever seen, biggest nest. It was like going up to the the hammer rest rail, like just piled up in the middle. And then the rat had taken so much food, cat food, oh, under the keys that the some of the keys were like being pressed up. It was so bad, and the it was like at a farmhouse. And so the guy was like, I told him I was like, I think there's rat, like there's probably rats in here. As soon as I picked it up and I saw that the mute rail was gone. I was like, I think there's rats. And as soon as we opened the front board, like, I was like, yeah, this is pretty bad, man. And uh, the but the worst I've heard is my mentor told me that he found a piano or that they, they were going to restore a piano that was in a barn and that the hole from the from the trap work or from the bottom of the piano to the key bed, when they pulled the knee board out, it was one big nest and like everything just came out. So the whole bottom cavity was just full. That's the worst I've heard of. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to ruin the meeting. That, but, yeah. David loves a good rat story. I know it. <laughs> I'm like Indiana Jones's dad in the last crusade. And he's like terrified of rats. He's like, my dad would never come here. He's afraid of rats. He hates them. That's me. Like, can't do it. Yeah, my cousin is, is wanting to give me a full upright. And it's in her garage and they just kind of like had it. And they're like, well, you know, we don't need it if you want it. So I went to go check it out. And I was like, yeah, it just looks nice. And I opened the top lid and I closed it immediately. And I was like, that smells like death. Like something died inside this piano. So I've been putting it off for a while to pick it up. <laughs> Anyways, about piano tools. <laughs> okay, let's move. I have another one. <laughs> okay, here we go. I have a video. Are you guys ready? This one. What's going on here? I love this. Brinian was tuning it. the other day, and hopefully okay. the sound. will make sure the sound. Wait, did that come through? There we go. Okay. Oh, it's just like oh, maybe it's maybe it's this one. Sorry. <sighs> there we go. I don't think the sound's coming through. What kind of sound is it making? It's it you guys can oh I wish you could hear it. Why isn't it working? Um 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 it's like making he he's right. He's hitting the note and it's making an octave lower tone at the same time. Like it's like ding, ding, and then it's like ding, ding. At the same time, I really botched that. Really? I wonder, so you guys can't hear that? No. Uh, Stacy, think... send it to me, send, email it to me, and maybe on Friday I can talk about okay. it. Okay, yeah, let's do that. I'm sorry. That's, that's crazy. If that's it, was, it was weird though. I couldn't even, I didn't even know what to tell him. I'm like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> So that's so weird. Sometimes my sound will come in on these videos and sometimes not. Um, I have another question. Pricing question. Okay. Pricing structure question. 
Um, we were talking the other day about our new rate customer or our rate for new customers, but we also have a re- like a loyalty member discount. I think that's what you mean. I think this is Philip, right? I think it's Philip's question. Um, okay. but then if you're going to do a return follow-up, do you give the established new client the new customer discount price or was it a premium for new customers and a loyalty discount for continuing user services? Oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. So, um, I, I think I had this the other day. We had a new customer. I charged them for a full price, two fifty, and then but their piano needed another tuning. So I just said, hey, it's, if you have it tuned within a month, it's going to be at a discounted rate, like service call rate at one ninety five. And guess what? That's actually our uh, loyalty member. So after that appointment, if you want to sign up for every year, you'll get that rate. So that's that's what I've done in the past. Um, I look at it; it's a fifty dollar difference. And fifty dollars to get a review, a longtime customer, a repeat, you know, on the schedule is totally worth it. And so what we do is we um, we request, but not really request. We're like, hey, we're going to send you a Google review. Um, if you have time to fill it out, great. And also we'll get you on the books for next year. And so that's just it's huge for us. We had to go with okay, what's the minimum we can go into a customer's house? We're really not missing out on anything. Thing, and we found that it's about fifty dollars less than what our normal rate is. Did that answer the question? Hopefully. Yeah, the pricing questions are hard because you'll find a lot of you'll find a lot of information out there with regarding like skills and and how to do certain piano things. But when it comes to how to price, there's more like crickets out there. People don't really know. There's not a, there's not a really good playbook for that. So. No, that's very true. And it's a balance between. Yeah. You're looking at. Oh, David and I were just talking about this the other day, how some techs don't value their work. And so they actually feel bad about charging like a decent (laughs) price for their work. Do you change, do you charge the same regardless of the market that you're in, since you're in multiple, you know, metropolitan cities, you, you charge the same rate. We charge different rates. We charge as much as three fifty for a tuning up in Seattle and two fifty for Portland, uh, two fifty for Denver, two fifty for, uh, Phoenix. So, uh, Seattle is just crazy. If we were in California or when we get to California, we'll probably charge more than three fifty. Um, but I mean, our starting, our starting wage for a full tech up in Seattle is like, you know, six figures. So we, you know, it's just more expensive to live up there. Yeah. It's so true. Yeah, yeah, oh, I, know those I was doing California some research. So oh, go ahead, Michael. The, the national average is about 115, 120 is the national average, I think, based on what I saw in some research that I, I was doing. I would say for single operators, um, 150 to 200 because of, of us being more of an, uh, a brick and mortar, if you will, whether, you know, it's, I, I, people are usually willing to pay more because there's like, okay, these guys are more established and there's some, some of this, it, just kind of like when you go buy your car at a Craigslist versus you go to a, a lot or you go to a retailer. So people are usually able to willing to pay a little bit more, but we haven't charged <laughs> Less than 125 in a decade. <laughs> Makes sense. It seems like the same with brands. You know, people buy a Sony because it, you know that name. They're like, all right, I'm not gonna have to worry about. It. It'll be consistent. Yep. Yep. Great question. Oh, did, did Philip have a follow-up question to it? I saw something pop up. Yeah. Yeah. So then, if you do a pitch raise and have to come back for a second appointment, is it still that? discounted rate like ours is 195 right so yeah. or is it further yeah. discounted yeah it's still so the if 195 they do, if they do that uh follow-up tuning though uh within a month yeah so that's that's another there's a caveat there if they have it done within a month there's that 195 or if they want to sign up for our loyalty membership next year it'll be 195 but it's not going to hold tune between now and next year so always incentivize them to come back give them more reasons to do so mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that's a good question. And just so everybody knows, like the whole idea, it's hard. Our, even We even struggle sometimes with our own technicians of feeling like, oh, I can't charge that. So that's why we've created more pricing structures, more more like things in writing, this is what it costs. And the more you can do that, the better for your customers because they're not going to think you're just making it up on the fly. It's like, nope, this is what it costs. You'll Yeah, be more credible. You'll be more credible. that's so true. David, were you gonna, we have like four minutes. Were you gonna, Ooh, time. <laughs> it's time. We do more questions on Friday, but it is time. <laughs> like, oh, we gotta do this. So this came from not... Hold on, I'll show you the predecessor, as most of you have seen. Oh, it seems so it seems so basic now. You're basic. Okay. <laughs> so this is what you know what we've had in the past. And um it, it was harder to find one, and a lot of people were asking about this. Plus, this is just kind of like flimsy, it's not great. Um, it does three measurements: let off, back checking, and blow distance. Great. So I called Mark. I'm like, hey, we're getting a lot of people asking about these. Where do you get them? He's like, I don't know. Those are, you know, those are fine, but they just never do enough. I'm like, yeah, what else could it do? And he was like, well, maybe we could have it also do this thing. I'm like, how about we do that? And then three times that. So I think what we have is something that does nine things now. So With this one tool, you can do, I'll just list them off. Blow distance, like the other. So it blows to distance from here to here. You can do let off. <laughs> you do back checking. You can do natural dip right there. You can do with this little slot that you see cut out right there. You can do after touch. With this, uh, one of these measurements, I have to remember all of them, you can do key height. That is actual, the uh, uh, key bed to the top of the key, key height at 60 to 65 millimeters. It's double-sided, so it allows you to really not have this rocking back and forth. Um, there's sharp height in here somewhere. <laughs> I can't even remember. Um, and there's... There's another one of these things. I should have written it all out, but there's basically nine or 10 measurements within this. And so this is actually going to be created at the same density. It's gonna be made of steel and thick enough so that it actually, you can put it in and do your aftertouch. So just so you all know, you know, aftertouch is that escapement of the jack. You know, it's a matter of key travel after let off. And so what this allows you to do, and this is actually a, um, uh, Renner has a similar tool, but it's just a single tool that does this, kind of it's something with a slit. So you actually just take this, put it underneath the front rail pin like that, and press down. And if it can achieve let off, like it just did, it's just the right amount of aftertouch. If it isn't, you can go ahead and either adjust your let off, your dip, or your hammer blow distance, all with this one tool. And so this is going to be known as the uh, ART in, in, the, in uh, supply, the, the artisan regulation tool, uh, or gauge, ARG, ARG, I don't remember, or something like that, but it was the artisan regulation gauge. And um, I'm just doing a little bit more testing with it, but it will be available soon and definitely something to get because... To be able to have everything all in one is just super easy. It's the pirate's tool. Arg. <laughs> But yeah, we're pretty Nice. excited about this. This is going to be the first of many tools that we're going to actually going to start creating, and I'm excited about that. They're probably all going to have wood, leather, and some kind of a brass and steel. <laughs> Awesome. I think there was another thing it did. It was like a handful of other things that did. And it, When it, it you was just. remember, when you remember, we'll have to write them all down. Yes. And it'll be on there. I should have written them down when, 
Oh, I should have written them down. It's <laughs> too many for me. I don't even remember all the things that did, but oh. we did everything. Well, thank you so much for sending in your questions. And <laughs> we just really enjoy, we really enjoy being with you guys three times yeah. a week. <laughs> so um, we will see you all on Friday morning for coffee hour. If you have right more questions, you're welcome to send them then, yep. or I'll try to get that video working on my end. But thank you yeah. so much, guys. See you on Friday. Bye. Bye. <laughs>